Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Fruitful Vine Podcast. I'm Tyler. I'm here with my pastor, Pastor Joel Urshan. Pastor, how's your day going so far? It's a good day. Good. That's a good day. God's been good. Yeah. Uh, we had storms this week, but we yeah. got through it, and uh, and we're we're doing good. Yeah. All it's, was well. It was it was rough these last couple of days. You never want to like underplay the weather guys, right? Right. Because you never know when they might be right. <laughs> yeah. You but never. But then know. you hunker down. <laughs> And nothing happened, and you feel a little silly. Yeah, yeah. But there was there were storms. It just kind Correct. of skirted Cincinnati a little bit. It did, it did. It wasn't as bad as it was forecasted, but that's all right. Yeah, we had had an evening of of hunkering down. Yeah, so that's yeah, always that's good. true. We did we did the same. <laughs> uh, we're coming out of uh, Easter season, Resurrection yeah. Weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had an Easter extravaganza here. Yes, um, on Saturday, uh, the Saturday before Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Uh, ton of people. I was actually yeah. not able to be there uh, for yeah. the event, but I heard there was just so many people, so many visitors, so many guests. So shout out to the Tree of Life team. Yes, uh, for putting on an amazing event. They did an amazing job. Yeah, I saw videos of my sons uh, scared to death of the uh, the petting zoo animals. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, just memories all around. Yeah, uh, eggs filled with candy and and prizes that have cluttered our homes, and just just a wonderful weekend. Yes, Sunday, of course. Uh, a lot of guests, a lot of visitors here at Tree of Life Church. Um, every kind of everyone kind of coming together to celebrate that Easter Sunday, and it's just uh, just a good weekend. It is a good weekend. It's a good week. Yeah, it's a good week. Starting with Palm Sunday. Yeah, through the week, Good Friday, uh, extravaganza. Yeah, uh, it's Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Yeah, the day it's it the whole week. There really is a focus on. Jesus, his triumphal entry, the betrayal, the uh, prayer in Gethsemane, the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection. It's just, it's a great week of celebration because we know what all of that means for us. Yeah. The uh, the entire world's eyes kind of shift over to the church. I think everyone, um, even some of those people who don't attend church regularly, um, feel it as their duty that they should go to church on, on Easter Sunday. And there's a reason for that. There is, there's a reason that that resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, the whole weekend, um, is a focal point of the calendar year. You know, as far as the churches go, that's a, it's a big Sunday, big Sunday. And, um, there's a reason for that. Yeah. It's not just a happenstance, but it's, it's one of the most pivotal moments in history that we celebrate every uh, every spring, every yeah. end of March or beginning of April, whenever it happens to fall. But but uh, there's a reason it's so important, and it's because of his life, his death, his burial, right. uh, and his resurrection. So I know you want to get, kind of get into and tag on the on the back of the resurrection yeah. theme and idea today, but why don't you just uh, dive right out on that? Sure. End? Yeah, we um, we want to talk a little bit about that uh, yeah. because we're everybody's minds have been focused on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ over the last little while, and um, and and we're out of that little holiday uh, stretch, yeah. but we're not out of remembering the death, burial, and resurrection. That's right. That's something that remains with us. <clears throat> it isn't just a one-time event for for the church. It's a daily thing. Uh, Paul even re- made reference to the statement. He said, "I die daily." And this really was connected to his teaching that we are to be crucified with Christ. Mm-hmm. And so the importance of this past week, let's break that down a little bit. Yeah. And um, let's talk about the, uh, the Lord's Supper. In fact, as we were, uh, uh, as we were getting ready to, to start today, we received a, a question yeah. um, that came in about the Lord's Supper and about why Jesus used the language of take, eat, this is my body, drink, this is my blood of the New Testament. And uh, it was kind of confirmation of what we were going to be talking about. So we'll we'll kind of dive into all of it. Uh, The Lord's Supper, which is, of course, when Jesus sat down with his disciples and took bread the same night that he was betrayed. And and they broke bread, and he he shared the bread with them and said that this is the, this is, the bread is, it represents my body, which is broken for you. It's it's going to be pierced for you. It's going to be crucified for you. 
and this is my uh, blood when he when he, they drank of the cup this is my blood which is shed for you <clears throat> and while he walked the earth he made the statement take eat this is my uh, body drink this is my blood in fact that statement alone was so um controversial yeah that many people left him they walked away from him and he looked at his disciples and said will you also go and it was peter who said to whom shall we go for thou hast the words of eternal life that's a good thing to remember when you feel like walking away from the lord where are you going to go yeah uh david said i i if i ascend into the heavens you are there and if i make my bed in hell behold thou art there so you, you're not going to really get away from him. And why would you want to? Because he truly does have the words of eternal life, the words that prepare us for eternal life, the words that uh, define and describe eternal life. And so Jesus making this statement about the, the bread and the cup, let's, let's just break that that down yeah because that's in essence what we were remembering this past week right as all eyes as you mentioned all eyes just kind of fell upon those days though that week um and we talk about the death the burial and the resurrection but before we talk about the death the burial and the resurrection let's talk about the life because it was the life of christ that made his death Mm. here's a word efficacious yeah meaning effectual or effective, capable. It made his death effective Mm -hmm. to remove our our sins, to be the substitutionary lamb for us. The Bible says that the law of Moses was a schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. And one of the things in the law, of course, was that spotless lamb. And that spotless lamb was the most innocent thing you could imagine. And, And it was... It was upon that lamb that the sins of of Israel were conferred, and it was the sacrifice of that lamb that atoned their sins, or at least deferred their sins, for uh, a year. And it was, of course, the Day of Atonement that <clears throat> that would give them another kind of a year's reprieve. But this was a schoolmaster. This was teaching them something. This was teaching them the importance of innocence. Uh, that innocence is the only thing that will remove the curse of sin. It taught them that the blood of a of a physical lamb is only symbolic. It's not going to accomplish the the real right. work because right. they're going to have to do this again next year. So all of that was preparing them for Christ who is coming. And this makes sense of what John the Baptist was saying when Jesus walks onto the scene and John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. Okay, him saying that immediately uh, provoked or evoked the understanding yeah. about the Lamb of, of the Old Testament. So he's saying, Behold the Lamb of God. He's pointing to a man, and that man is Jesus. And all eyes now are on Jesus. He's the Lamb. So... It's switching from symbol, the Lamb of the Old Covenant, to substance, the true, living, breathing, walking, human Lamb of God. And then John confirms what he's talking about by saying, which taketh away the sin of the world. And this, of course, even makes it more pronounced because now they're understanding that this Lamb of God is different than the Lamb of the Old Covenant in the sense that the Lamb of the Old Covenant would could defer the sins of, of Israel for another year, whereas this Lamb, Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of what that old law represented, is actually that the power is within him and through his sacrifice to take away the sin of the world, to take it away, not yeah. defer it, but to remove it if, in fact, people will, will believe on him and obey his word. So, so it, it, it's, this really is the gospel message. It's the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection. But let's, let's stay focused a little bit on that life, yeah. okay? Because, the, again, the life is what makes the death what the death was. This wasn't just the death of a good man or the death of a of a martyr for a good cause. 
This was the death of the spotless, true lamb of God. And, and, and what made him that lamb was his life. His life was lived in obedience to the word of God. So he lived his life. Of course, he was the he was the long-awaited Messiah. He was born of a virgin. Um, he was uh, Isaiah spoke so frequently about even his childhood. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And then Isaiah seven fourteen, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child. And so. Uh, These prophecies and these statements concerning Jesus' uh, birth, Jesus' uh, childhood, and his life that he lived, he was the spotless lamb. And the Bible says that he was tempted in all points as we are tempted, but he was without sin, and that's the difference. He was without sin, but he was tempted in all points as we are tempted. It's important for people to know that there's nothing you've been tempted to do that Jesus wasn't also tempted by it, but he didn't fall to the temptation. Mm -hmm. He overcame the temptation. And really, truly, he confronted those sins, those temptations on our behalf because we just stumble and bumble into, you know, we fall headlong into every temptation in our our human condition, our fallen, broken human condition. But Jesus encounters these uh, sinful temptations. He overcomes each of them, takes authority over them. Okay, that's very important, right. understanding the life of Jesus. He takes authority over them. When he takes authority over those sinful temptations, the authority is now in him. Right. The authority over those sins, sins that will send a person to hell. Sins that will bind a person spiritually, mentally, emotionally, even physically. Sins that will destroy a person's life. Jesus took authority over those sins by resisting the temptation to commit those sins. Now, that's what he did in his body. Okay, it was his body that resisted those temptations. But here's where the blood comes into play. It goes back to an old, uh, an Old Testament prophecy or, or an Old Testament uh, a directive from Moses in the Law of Moses, where that he says, "Do not eat the blood of an animal." Right. And then he explains why, because he says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Right. And I hate to mess with, I hate to mess with people's medium rare steaks and <laughs> whatnot. Um. But the fact is, if you eat the blood of an animal, you're, Moses said the life of that animal's flesh is in its blood. So there's a reason why they, they said don't eat the blood of that animal. Because if that animal ate something, you would never eat because it's, because it's unclean. Right. Um, if you eat the blood of that animal, it's as though you did eat that unclean thing that otherwise you would never have eaten. Because the... The record of that of that experience within the physical body of that animal, the life of the flesh is in the blood. The experience of the flesh is in the blood. What happened in the life of that fleshly creature is recorded in its blood. So Moses said, Don't eat the blood because you're you're consuming into yourself and into your bloodstream. It's as though you ate it when mm-hmm. You may not have eaten the the uh, the atrocious thing you would never eat, but you ate the blood of that animal. So yeah. so essentially you did. And Jesus' life, the life of his flesh, the life of his physical body is in his blood. So inside of his blood is the record right. that he overcame sin, yeah. that he overcame all the sins, all the temptations that have caused humanity to just trip up over and over and over again. And and now the power over those things is in the blood of Jesus Christ. 
So now Jesus is spotless. He's innocent. He is without sin. And he's he's going to the cross. You know, we go to Gethsemane, of course, and he says, can this cup pass from me? And and nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And this great moment where Jesus surrenders his will to the divine will. So it's not the human will at work. It's the divine will at work. So many powerful truths and lessons in that. But Jesus surrenders to the divine will, which is for him to take the cup, and that cup is found in the Old Testament too. Yeah. That that the, the the Bible describes a cup that is filled with the wrath of God, and it's going to be poured out upon the people. So when Jesus is negotiating whether he has to take this cup, it's a cup of wrath he's going to be taking. Yeah, and 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 that's what is so terrifying. That's what you see when you see the brutality of the cross. This horrible, yeah. brutal death. Well, it was the cup yeah. of God's wrath against sin. When you look at the beaten, broken, wounded body of Christ, you're looking at the anger of God towards sin. Right. He was without sin. He knew no sin. He was tempted in all points as we are tempted, yet without sin, but became sin. Yeah. He was made to be sin for us. us. Yeah. And so he's on that cross, but this cup, this, this cup that he's negotiating, finally, you know, he surrenders to, to the divine will. He's going to take the cup. It's the cup that should have been poured upon you and I, mm-hmm. upon everybody watching and listening. It should have been poured upon us. That's the wage of sin. That's the wage of sin. We, yeah. were, we were doomed to die. Mm-hmm. And, and so Jesus steps in. Ta- he's qualified to take the cup. Yeah. Because he's innocent. He's spotless. He's the lamb. He's the real lamb that all these other lambs have been have been pointing to. Yeah. And so when he goes to the cross, he goes to the cross with a body that has never committed sin, with a physical body that has resisted all manner of temptation yeah. and has healed all manner of diseases. That's an important point. Yeah. There's no disease that his blood doesn't have the power over. While he walked the earth, he healed all manner of diseases. So there's no COVID variant that that the blood of Jesus doesn't already have the power over. There is no cancer that the blood of Jesus doesn't already have the power over. There is no mutation of any virus or bacterium that the blood of Jesus doesn't already have the power over. He has the power. Yeah. This is why the the old time uh, songwriters used to say it like this: "There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood." Yeah. Bishop G. T. Haywood wrote, "In sin I wandered sore and sad, with bleeding heart and aching head, till Jesus came and sweetly said, 'I'll take your sins away. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood that washes white as snow.'" He walks to the cross with a body that has never committed sin and blood that has power over every sin and over every sickness. And they crucify him. They lacerated him. They they beat him. They nailed him to the cross. This horrific scene of murder and brutality unfolds in the scriptures and many a passion presentation have been made concerning that that fact and when that blood was shed it was it was the moment that changed everything forever it opened the door for whosoever will to step into the covenant that god had made with israel yeah. and now anybody and everybody can can step into the the glorious covenant of god so it was his body that 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 lived the life that qualified him to be the lamb. Yes, he was God manifest in the flesh. Yes, he was born of a virgin. Yes, he grew in wisdom and in stature. And as he lived that life, it's important to remember he was a human being. Yeah. This was God manifest as a man. He was a human being. He resisted temptation because he loves us. And he was 
he was determined to go to the cross with a with an innocent record so that he could do what no man had been able to do. The Bible says he sought for an intercessor and found none, so his right arm brought him salvation. And and so he goes to the cross out of his love for us with an innocent record which made his blood I'm going to use the word again, efficacious. Yeah. It his blood had the power to wash away sin and to heal every sickness. So when he sits down with his disciples in that last supper, as we would call it, the night that he was betrayed, he says, I have bread that's broken for you, and I have, I have a cup that I want you to drink, and this bread is reflective of my body, and this cup is reflective of my blood. It was his body that was innocent, and it was his blood that had the power. And you can wrap that up in the statement, he was obedient, or the obedience of Christ. So there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians 10 where it talks about spiritual warfare. And if, if you've quoted scriptures about spiritual warfare, you're probably familiar with it uh, because it says, um, we wrestle not against flesh and uh, blood, but against principalities and powers. In 2 Corinthians, that's Ephesians 6. 2 Corinthians 10 right. uh, is St- Paul writing the church at Corinth, and he goes along with that and says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination, bringing every thought into captivity And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and and the captivity that it brings it into, he says, is the obedience of Christ. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Okay, the obedience of Christ is his body and his blood. That's his body and his blood. His body that was lived a life of obedience and his blood that has the power because of that obedient life. Let's go back to an Old Testament uh, uh, scripture that, that references obedience. Samuel and Saul. Remember, the Old Testament testifies of Jesus. Right. So it's not just, a, not just a Bible story. It's testifying of Jesus to come. Samuel comes upon Saul. Saul has disobeyed uh, the word of God. He's offering the sacrifice. Should have waited for Samuel. Didn't. He's, he has the anointing of a king, but he's acting like he's a priest. And Samuel is, is upset with this. And Saul said, well, you know, I figured I'd just go ahead and proceed. And Samuel makes a statement to Saul. He said, to obey is better than sacrifice. And we summarize that by saying obedience is better than sacrifice. And to hearken is better than the fat of rams. So he's saying being obedient is is better than the sacrifice itself. So I, I know you felt like there needed to be a sacrifice made. That's true. But being obedient is even better than the sacrifice being made. Yeah. So now apply that to Jesus since it testifies of Jesus. We know that from what Jesus said. Right. Now apply that to Jesus. And and it's true. His obedience was even better than his sacrifice. His sacrifice. That's what we celebrated this last week. Right. But why did we celebrate his sacrifice? Because his sacrifice was efficacious. His sacrifice was, it had the power. It yeah. was capable of accomplishing what God set out to do by being in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. And that was made possible through that life of obedience. Right. So, so his sacrifice was great. The sacrifice of Calvary was great. What made it great was the life of obedience that he lived. So you and I, we have to be obedient. Yeah. Um, and we've already messed that up. Mm-hmm. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's yeah. like once we realize how obedient we're supposed to be, we're like, uh-oh, because I've got like years of yeah. disobedience to account for. And we're so used to celebrating mercy and talking about mercy that we don't realize no sin is going to enter that city. Mm -hmm. Like sin is not welcome there. Sin will not be allowed there. Right. So what do you do about that? I'm glad you asked. That's where the body and the blood of Jesus come in. 
his death upon the cross replaces the death you and I have coming to us right. as a result of our sin. And and it is because of his obedience that his death has that power. He's not just another martyr. He's not just another uh, great guy who died for a good cause. No, he is the spotless lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Yeah. And and it is his obedience that that we are putting our faith in and it's the blood that he shed that we put our faith in. Yeah. And so when he dies the death of the cross, he's obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That means he was obedient all the way up unto death, and, and the death of the cross no less right. is what Paul is saying there. So now, how do we become obedient? By being in Christ. Mm -hmm. This is where Acts 2.38 comes in. Acts 2.38 is our opportunity to identify with his death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah. So Acts 2.38, for those who don't know, it's the first time that the answer is given concerning the question, what shall we do? Yeah. Following the resurrection of Christ, the Jews realized that they crucified Messiah, and they asked this they are incredulous when they figure this out. What shall we do? They're terrified. And the first time that question is answered is key, and it influences the rest of the acts of the apostles, the way they baptize. It, they were fulfilling the great commission of Matthew 28, 19. They were revealing the name that Jesus was talking about in Matthew 28, 19. And, and here it is, repent. This is what you shall do. Repent. Well, when he said repent... That, that's our opportunity to identify with the death of Christ. Repentance essentially puts to death the sin in our life because we stop doing it yeah. and we turn away. Uh, baptism, he said, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That is your opportunity to identify with the burial of Christ. And then he said, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that's where the resurrection power is. Right. The book of Romans says that that spirit, if that spirit which raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, okay, that's the indwelling mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, and it's the spirit that lives in us when right. we receive the Holy Spirit. And the, the writer said, if that spirit dwell in you, the same shall quicken your mortal body. That's a reference to the resurrection. Our mortal body is our dead body, and it's our dying body. If if you if when the Lord returns and, and you're here uh, for the sounding of the trumpet, those that are uh, alive and remain shall be caught up. And that's the quickening of your mortal body. It happens through the power of the Holy Ghost. Right. So repentance is 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 connected to is our connection to His death. Baptism in Jesus' name is our connection to his burial. And, and then, of course, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost is our connection to his resurrection. And it's a beautiful, beautiful plan of yeah. salvation. And, and it is the, and it identifies us with that blameless body, yeah. that powerful, all powerful blood of Jesus to remit sins. You see little glimpses of the blood throughout the Old Testament. One case that I'll bring up is when Moses uh, puts his rod into the water mm -hmm. supply of Egypt, and the water turns to blood. Well, when the water, it didn't turn into fruit punch or Hawaiian punch yeah. or just red you water. Know, yeah, dyed uh, water. Exactly. Yeah. It turned into blood. Yeah. And when it turned into blood, everything in it died. All the fish died. Uh, all of the organisms died all of the parasites died mm -hmm. all of the bacterium and viruses and fungi died inside that water when it turned to blood well when we're baptized in jesus name uh really repentance is us turning from sin that mm -hmm. that stops sin from continuing yeah. in you know it's us walking away from sin but when we're baptized in jesus name that washing that washing of our sins away by the blood of the lamb that covers the sins we have committed mm -hmm. in our life 
and it takes care of our record, and it actually is putting Christ on us so that now we become innocent. Right. How'd that happen? We can point to dates and times and places where we've committed sin, but when you're as many as have put on, are baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So now Christ has put on me in baptism, and now my record is clean. Mm-hmm. Why? Because Joel's such a great guy? No. <laughs> yeah. Because his record is clean. Right. All of a sudden, I become blameless and innocent. How? Not because I'm blameless or innocent, but because Jesus Christ is blameless and innocent. That's the body. Yeah. That's the blood. And so the Bible says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And later the writer would say that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Right. And that correlates to Acts 2.38 that calls for that remission of sins at baptism in Jesus' name. Because there, it's identifying you with when he shed his blood, yeah. was buried in a borrowed tomb, and then the Bible says you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And when Jesus was, when he died the death that he died and was buried, he didn't have to then from that point find a way to get out of that tomb and fight his way out and push his way out yeah. and, and try to uh, manhandle death. No, it, he did all of that when he was taking authority over sin, That's right. resisting temptation, healing all manner of disease. He did that in his body so that when he went into the grave, they had no jurisdiction over his body body. Death had no jurisdiction over his body. Remember that death came by sin. So death wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for sin. Right. We wouldn't know what a mortuary is, an undertaker, a funeral home, a hearst, an obituary, a graveyard, a tombstone, an epitaph, yep. a, a eulogy for the deceased. We wouldn't know any of those things. And if you take a moment and look around our world at the death industry, everything man has made has been somehow responding to death, trying to prevent death, whether it's a hospital or or it, 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 you drive up and down the interstates of major cities and you'll see whole buildings designated for particular health reasons. The Spinal Institute and the the Heart Institute and neuroscience centers and yeah. uh, it's what 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 are we talking about? It's catering to the human body that is dying. Death has entered our world and it has affected the way all of us live. But in Christ, there is the hope of glory, and Christ in us is the hope of glory, because that's when. Us being in Christ, that's repentance and baptism in his name. Christ being in us, that's receiving the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And it's, it's just such a beautiful thing. So, yeah, it's, let's, let's remember it on this week and every week. Yeah. But when he died that death of the obedient lamb and, and went into the grave, that was it. Grave had no authority over him. He didn't have to fight his way out. He was going to come out victorious regardless because the only thing that gives death jurisdiction over us is our sin now talk about your sins being washed away talk about there not being sin in your life this body this physical body should the lord tarry will die but but the dead in christ shall rise first so it's this is why it's so important and why he said take this bread and eat it it needs to be in you it needs to become you the bread was symbolic there's no magic in the bread the bread was symbolic it was his body that was so vital and when he's when he the reason he uses the language eat take eat this is my body because he wants it to become you. He right. wants you to become that innocent person. 
So again, the bread is symbolic, and the the cup is symbolic. The cup of the wine of the the blood that that reflects and represents the blood of the new covenant. Yeah. It too is symbolic, but there's a reason he says, "Take, drink. This is my blood that I shed for you. The yeah. blood of the new covenant." He wants it to get in you. He wants his blood to become the innocence of your life. Yeah. That's what he wants. And so that he uses the symbolism of the bread and the cup of the Lord's Supper to demonstrate it, and he wants to keep us in remembrance. That's what he said it was for. It's mm-hmm. for remembrance. Right. This do in remembrance of me, in remembrance of me. Don't ever forget it. Yes, that's why we that's why we make a big deal out of this past week. Uh, triumphal entry, death, burial, resurrection. Yeah, we're going to keep making a big deal about it, not just this past week, but every week and every day. This do in remembrance of me. I believe that every time we sit down to eat, yeah. we need to eat the food in remembrance of his sacrifice. Right. Because as we are nourished physically by the food we eat, it is a remembrance of how his body yeah. lived the overcoming life that we must live yeah. and th- that empowers us to live that overcoming life. And when we take drink uh, at lunch, at dinner, whenever it is that we're drinking water, anything you're drinking, make sure I, I do that in remembrance of the blood right. because just as that water, just as any any hydration is nourishing my body that's what his blood does yeah for it that's the life that he brings me the life is in that blood yeah. so the life of christ is in that blood how is that blood applied that's applied through repentance baptism in jesus name and receiving of the gift of the holy ghost and so uh, this is what we do uh, in remembrance of him. This is why we sing the songs about the blood, why we preach about the blood, why we why we talk about the life of Jesus. And yes, the, the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus, and him showing himself alive by many infallible proofs, and him ascending on high, after telling his disciples to go to Jerusalem and tarry for the promise of the Father, him pouring out the promise upon them, and him empowering them from within until he returns. And he'll be returning very soon in Jesus' name. But this is why he saved us. Mm -hmm. He saved us. You know one of the saddest things that I heard? I heard somebody call themselves a cultural Christian. It was a very renowned atheist. Mm. And he said that he's a cultural Christian. He said, I don't believe in Christ. He said, I don't believe in any of it. He said, but it's, it's making me sad that our world is stepping away from Christianity because it is a proven fact that Christian societies are good societies and good cultures. And it made me so sad because he wants the culture of Christ without the cross of Christ, yeah. without the resurrection of Christ. He doesn't want Christ to be real. He just wants everything Christ said and did to be applied. And that's that's sad to me. You you the culture of Christ comes as a result of his cross. Right. So it's not just a cross that he was crucified on, but he looked at us and said, "Take up your cross yeah. and follow me. Yeah. I'm going to show you what to do." When somebody wounds you, when you go through the struggles of life, you're just going to let your flesh be crucified. Repent. I'm going to show you how to handle a cross. I'm going to show you what to do with the cross that you're carrying. And so today, repent. Repent if you haven't already. Do it. Walk away from sin. Walk away from the, from the, the, the sin and the shame. And, and be baptized in Jesus' name name take on his identity because it is his identity that has the power over the sin that keeps tormenting you yeah and and he'll wash your sins away and let him fill you with his spirit the holy ghost has been poured out yeah it's not something we have to wait for we don't have to go tarry in jerusalem now 
the Holy Ghost is being poured out everywhere. Mm-hmm. Let him pour it out upon you. It's his desire, and it's a promise that you can lay claim to in Jesus' name. Yeah, amen. So good today, so so powerful. Uh, maybe you've not been in church um, very long, and the songs about the blood um, are kind of off-putting to you, and you're like, man, they, they sing about the blood a lot. They talk about the blood, and sometimes we get so caught up in celebrating it that we forget that it's it can kind of be a— yeah. Some people get squeamish of blood. It, it, it can almost have the effect on people that it did when Jesus said, "Take exactly. eat my body and blood." Yeah. But when the, when you when you begin to realize the power that is within His blood, that's right. There no there being no record of wrong. That's kept, right. That's right. That's when you start singing about it and, oh, and yeah. pleading it. Yeah. Because now you don't just have to <laughs> plead innocent. Yes. You just plead His blood. Right. And if you need overcoming power, you plead the blood. If you need protection you plead the blood if you need forgiveness of sins you plead the blood yeah. and and the record of his life will now be over you yeah amen so good today and that's how you that's really how you plead the blood is by yeah. repentance and baptism yeah. in his name and and the receiving of his spirit don't wherever you are don't stop if you've repented, mm. but you've not been baptized in Jesus' name, don't just camp out at repentance. Yeah, just just go ahead and do what the Scripture says, and let God perform His miracle of sanctification in your life, yeah. where He will wash you clean from sin, fill you with His Spirit, and and give you that precious mm. and holy gift that uh, will change your life and eternity. Yeah, it's new life. It's like getting new blood. That's right. It's it's a new life. You'll That's be right. rejuvenated in Him. Amen. Pastor Urshan, thank you today for for Amen. expounding on so many scriptures and just in uh, making His blood more applicable to us and uh, efficacious yes. in our own life. Yes, I got to say it right today. <laughs> Amen. Well, we love you. God bless you today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.